they not only have in the breeding sections of these farms, but they're enhancing the quality of those, those animals. They're trying to raise those animals to be able to sustain themselves, uh, prevent some kind of diseases. And uh, the, uh, hey, maybe. <laughs> and now they're doing intensive wildlife management and breeding. So I want to take a little bit of a look at that. What's it worth in South Africa? Photographic tourism, things that I've been doing for the last 12 years, taking people to a country to see animals. That's what they want the animals and birds. And it's worth uh, 31 million US dollars. You know, interesting wildlife production, these big game farms is also producing millions of dollars. And uh, they have all kinds of curios. You can buy a, an elephant tail if you want to. You can buy uh, skins of zebras. You can buy all kinds of things on the market. But there's also game meat. They found out in South Africa that raising cows was difficult because you had to have a lot of water, a lot of land, you needed feed, you needed alfalfa, you needed corn, you needed all those things, and the land would not sustain that. So then the farmers began to utilize this land and breed animals that could live off the natural habitat. And they would manage that natural habitat to enhance the amount of food available to the animals on their game farm. Interesting thing, hunting is very deeply ingrained in the culture of South Africa. Uh, it's billions of dollars of, of money annually for the South African people. What's very interesting, most people go, well, hunters, Three-fourths of these people are native South Africans that are doing the hunting. Only one-fourth of them come from international community. And that's something that very few people think about. They tend to say they're all from countries coming from other countries <clears throat> to hunt. That's not true in South Africa. They have a very large hunting population. They do hunt on these big game farms, but they do harvest the right variety of things. These locations, I'm not going to spend much time on this, but uh, Limpopo, Mapumalamba, uh, and Quasi Zulu, Natal, those are all in the northeast sector. It's a very lush area of, of uh, South Africa. And then the other, the North Cape, uh, Northwest, Western Cape, are on the very far western side. Lots of agricultural land in between and lots of desert. So uh, these are located in different areas of the country. You might find this interesting. These are now certified official game animals in South Africa. You look at this list, you'll see things up there. Uh, you'll see uh, Burchell's zebra. That's one that uh, you can go to the supermarket, you can buy zebra meat. You can go and buy kudu, you can go and buy impala. You can get uh, blue and black wildebeest. These are all available in your supermarket instead of buying your meat that's uh, cattle or, or pork. But all of these are being raised on these game farms intensively for both hunting purposes and meat purposes. From a meat purpose, uh, well, let me just uh, go back to this. You look at this list. These are a typical game farmer. This is the game farm that I work with when I do my photography safari. Kalubi Game Farm, 11,000 acres of breeding specialty farm. And otherwise, they raise the bulls that are the highest quality bulls that you can pick up uh, in order to enhance your herd if you're another game farmer. So my good friend, Daniel Dutois, raises sable, cape buffalo, kudu, niala, zebra, and multi-phased impala, and eland. We'll see some pictures of these in a little bit. But keep in mind, each one of the farmers has a specialty. His specialty is raising breeding stock. The big game vets play a really important role in all these big game farms. Uh, I was here when we captured this as a sable that we darted. Uh, the reason we darted that this is a sable has about a 48 inch curl horn. A uh, great breeding bull, the big game hunters want one like that. However, Daniel breeds these. We had to put rubber tips on the end, shrink wrap them, in order to keep this bull from killing the younger bulls. 
<laughs> because they're these are wild animals. These are not tame animals in these game parks. They're wild. So the big game vet comes. He uh, helped dart this. Of course, we got to pet it. You know, uh, we got to go up close to it. And uh, I, we've darted a, a number of them on different trips. But they play a major role, and they're very important to helping stay in the numbers of animals on these farms. They do game captures. This is a herd of, of blue wildebeest. The blue wildebeest is a uh, very good meat animal. You like a cow, you cut the horns off, you like cow. Uh, very high caliber, lean meat because they are living on the natural vegetation. They don't have much fat to them. And so they sell these at the meat market and uh, hunters also hunt these for, and local people hunt them for biltong. Biltong, we would call it jerky. However, their jerky is about a half inch thick, about two inches wide, and about a foot long. And it's sun dried. And you'll see people walking down the street with a pocket knife with a slab of biltong carving off a piece to eat. In every community, they have a biltong store. So it's very, very freely available, lots of it in South Africa. These are farm animals. I'm going to run through a series of them. The zebra, zebra tastes great. <laughs> Ned and I, we had, we had zebra, we had kudu, and we had niala in March. And we did a South African braai, which was their barbecue. And so we got to try out all of these and uh, very, very tasty. A lot of people say, oh, you could eat zebra? <laughs> oh, I could possibly eat a zebra. South Africa, they go, that's the best meat we have. <laughs> the blessed block has a nice blaze white face, uh, medium sized antelope. They have 19 different varieties of antelopes. So this is a good size one. This is the blue wildebeest. Uh, again, a nice specimen. This was taken at the, a game ranch that specialized in raising blue wildebeest, particularly for hunting <laughs> This is a golden wildebeest. This is a variant, much like we have gray squirrels. You see gray squirrels, all of a sudden you see a black squirrel. Then you see one that's got a little bit of red. Same is true with wildebeest. A lot of different colors and variations. This is one of the dangerous animals that they raise on these big game farms. Uh, the hunters hunt these for that big mass uh, of horns. Uh, the people in South Africa get to eat all the meat, or they sell it at the meat market. So when a hunter comes in and they harvest a cape buffalo, that person gets the, they could have the skin, they could have the cape, they could do a mount if they want, but all the meat goes back to the farmer or it's given to the local community. So it's a source of protein. One of my favorite animals, farm animals, is the greater kudu. This would be much like our elk that they have a spiral horn, and there are four different spiral horn antelopes in South Africa, but the great kudu is, is one of them. This is also a farm animal. <laughs> I have a good friend uh, that is now in the process of trying to get the South African government to approve the sale of rhino horns. Last month, they were this close to having it happen. The way they're doing this, the problem with rhinos is the far eastern countries prize the horn as, as a medical supplement. They have to be the acrocorneas. It's supposed to be pure headaches. It's supposed to cure indigestion and a whole bunch of other host of things. So what's happened is this is being poached all over Africa. And the numbers are going down, 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 down. The only hope of saving this animal is to raise them on big game farms. And my good friend has 2,000 of them right now. What they're doing is they're taking the DNA of the horn, taking the DNA of the rancher, the owner of the ranch, taking the DNA of the seller, all three must match in order to be a legal sale. So that kind of hope for future to controlling the illegal hunting, because they can raise these animals quite well on big farms 
and really increase the numbers. This is what I call the, the breeding of impala. Uh, here's four young impala. The one on the left, as you look at the picture, is what's called a saddleback. It's got a brown back. And of course, the black one standing beside it. The, no, the regular phase impala is the one that's in the third to the right, and then the white phase. These are prized by people who uh, have them on their game farms, partly for show. They like to have them around. For, for eating purposes, they raise the regular one. If you look at an impala from behind, there's a big black M on the back of them. And we always say that's the McDonald's of the belt. Oh, okay. <laughs> but all the animals predators love to eat impala. And so do the people of South Africa. I think that's a great animal. Now, there are some issues facing the farmers that they're very concerned about. One is they're really concerned about the threat of the animal rights movement. We have a large population of people in the world who believe that no way we should be killing any of these animals. It should never happen, except who's going to save them? Who's going to raise them? Who's going to take care and make sure you have numbers and habitat for these animals if you don't have someone supporting them? Uh, there a lot of research out that says the, uh, the value of hunting to conservation efforts is pretty well established. There's a very great market value of a particular animal. Uh, imagine what would happen in Wisconsin if we quit hunting deer for about eight years. We would be overrun with deer They'd eat up the habitat and then the population would crash. And all of a sudden we'd be looking back saying, where did the deer go? And so the scientific data is there. Uh, there's a lot of countries that are banning various things. Uh, we can't bring certain things to the United States, but you can take ivory to other countries, perfectly legal. So they're concerned about that. They're concerned that there's a lack of groups throughout the world studying the decreasing number of wild animals and what can be done to save them into the future. Uh, we're seeing the effects of climate change. We're seeing the effects of massive population growth. We're seeing the changes of, of uh, all, all the people who want to use these animals, but now they're over harvest them. And so they just begin to disappear. Uh, South Africa doesn't have a great conservation, countrywide conservation uh, ethic. It's not really well established. 30 years ago, they moved to apartheid. And through that process, uh, a new population of people began to run the country and uh, make new policies. Not very strong at this time. Not a strong Department of Natural Resources countrywide. And so they're lacking leadership. And they're trying to figure out how to protect the national park habitats. And we'll go into that a little bit more later. In all these countries of Africa, there's an immense lack of financial resources to handle this kind of issue. And there's probably in many countries, not a lot of people say, well, we can't do anything. And well, what are we gonna do? It's too late. They're just gonna have to disappear. I do mission work in Ghana. I can guarantee you if you go through Ghana and you're looking for birds, they've caught most of them in mist net and they're now in the soup pot. Very few birds in Ghana anymore. Have you had an elephant? No, we're gonna talk about elephants. This big guy, uh, I got the chance to hug him. This was four years ago. Ned uh, hugged him this year. And uh, this elephant grew another thousand pounds and a foot taller in four years. <clears throat> immense animal, just an immense animal. So Kruger National Park has an elephant problem. Now, uh, what you read in the newspaper, uh, elephants are being exterminated all over the world. They're becoming fewer and fewer elephants, and that's true if you look countrywide, country to country to country. But if you go to specific locations and you start looking at your elephant population, Kruger probably has a real problem. 
The current, current park is 56 miles or 220 miles long, 56 <clears throat> miles wide. A very large area, totally fenced. They have about 33,000 elephants. Almost everything you read in the literature, if you went to the internet, they would tell you they have eight or nine thousand. They want to maintain their national park status at a certain level that they have to promote. The projection right now, 2026, they're going to have 56,000 or 50,000 plus elephants just because of natural reproduction. The gestation is a couple of years, it takes a while. And be honest with you, I've been there 12 years and I've watched them literally eating Kruger National Park. Okay, what are they eating? African elephants can eat up to 600 pounds of food a day. I calculated that out. I go, that's 219,000 pounds a year. One elephant. A 50-year-old 50, 50 bull has eaten 10,959,000 pounds of forage in 50 years. And this elephant's name is Axe. He's one of the 10 largest living elephants in South Africa. He's 65 years old. He may last another couple of years, but he's eating 14 million pounds of food. <laughs> now take all that, you take, take those 33,000 elephants, you begin to get a picture of what the problem is, what the, what the habitat can sustain because we're not managing these animals. Typical herd, uh, they feed on these kind of things. And I just kind of focus on Kruger National Park because it gives you a picture. Uh, they call it shrub mopani. Mopani trees normally would be 25 to 40 feet tall. Now they're shrubs. The elephants have pushed the big trees over, eaten the tops off of them. <coughs> and so now they look like 10 foot high shrubs. Well, you go, that's pretty high shrubs, but an elephant's as tall as the ceiling. So they're going to mow it off the tops of these trees. A lot of red willow and red bush willow and thorn trees in the central part of the park. And then we get down to the areas that's more grassland, you get thorns of various kinds. And they get the marula trees. The marula trees have a wonderful fruit that uh, all kinds of animals like. And if you go to our liquor stores, you can buy amarula. Uh, amarula is a liqueur made from the marula fruit. And so a lot of people are picking these up. They have some knob thorn, leadwood, Marula, the main species of the grassland area. So the elephants are herd animals. Typical herd, anywhere from 15 to 40 animals, sometimes even bigger. Remember 33,000 number. You've got a lot of different little groups of, of elephants wandering around. The cow, is uh, the matriarch is led by the, usually the oldest cow who knows where the good food is and knows where the water sources are. And everybody else follows along. Now, if we we're going to reduce that population, we couldn't go in there and shoot the cow, the major. The rest of them would be lost. If you shoot some of the younger ones up to say 15 years old, now all of a sudden the older ones are getting real angry. And elephants do get angry. They remember. Elephants have a good memory. They do. And they become unmanageable. So when you're going to reduce numbers, you've got to go in and get them all. You can't just go in and get a few of them. They do a lot of damage. This is kind of a fuzzy picture, but in the foreground, you can see all the little dead brush in the foreground. That's what's left of Mopani trees that the elephants have pushed over, munched off the tops, moved on, pushed another one down, and you end up with these small trees and small diameter. Because pretty soon another elephant group will come along, push them down, and they'll turn into the shrub land. And then you get uh, what happens is you start looking like this. You get a lot of grasslands because they pushed it down. Uh, elephants like grass, they do eat a lot of grass, but they also start munching off the tops of those uh, Mopani trees. Well, there are some periods. I'm going to switch horses. Let's talk about. Uh, Predators, uh, the leopard, cheetah, wild dog, lion, hyena, and jackal. Leopard is still relatively plentiful uh, across South Africa. 
It can climb fences easily and move in and out of game farms. And they do hunt leopards in South Africa. Uh, but they're they're fairly uh, uh, easy to find. Cheetahs, though, different story. Cheetahs are, need open space, low grasslands in order to uh, thrive. And uh, there's only 120 of them left in Kruger. Used to be a lot of them. Climate change is affecting the grasslands. This year, they had a massive amount of water, big storms, lots of lots of rain, and the grass grew this high. And so, least waste type. Kruger's and uh, cheetahs have a tough time. They can't get up high enough to see the animals they feed on. So they're really struggling right now in order to survive. Wild dogs are another one. Many people have never seen a wild dog. Uh, there are less than 120 of them. We were fortunate to see a, a pack of wild dogs. Uh, they live in packs anywhere from uh, eight to 20 in a typical pack of all ages. They chase their prey down like our wolves do. Uh, they can actually feed on most anything that they can catch. Uh, they'll do that. And uh, they're beautiful animals. Uh, but the game farmers want nothing to do with these. If you're going to have wild dogs, you got to have them in the, in the parks and you got to manage them to make sure they have enough food. Otherwise, they're going to disappear very shortly. I threw this one in because this, they go, we hear a lot of talk about hunting. And uh, this particular lion was, uh, my, my outfitter was called and said, we got two problem lions. He said, they're two brothers, they're very old, their teeth have worn down. It's at a point where they can no longer capture their favorite food, which is Cape Buffalo. Lion can take down a Cape Buffalo. It's a big animal. And so they went to the next easiest place. They ended up people. They don't run very fast. <laughs> Let's catch a few people. They're easy to eat. And so these particular two uh, animals were killing people. So the South African government said, we need a hunter to come in and exterminate these two. Well, they did it a little different. We didn't just go out and just shoot the two animals. They said, look, we have a person in Russia who happened to be equivalent to our Secretary of State who wanted to hunt an alliance. We'll charge him an arm and a leg to come shoot this lion. <laughs> Not only will the outfitter, who's my, my uh, one holding a gun, that's my outfitter, he's a professional hunter. He did not shoot that animal. The Secretary of State of Russia shot him, but you're not allowed to take a picture of the Secretary of State. So he had to pose with the animal. <laughs> they mounted this animal, it's not in Russia, in some place. And the South African government got a lot of money, and my outfitter got a lot of money <laughs> for harvesting this particular animal. It's a big issue. Do you hunt lions or not? When do you hunt them? There are lion farms, and there are ethical issues with those farms. Uh, so he, he just, just threw that up, but I thought it would be interesting. There's a lot of spotted hyenas. These are one of the great predators of the Kruger. The spotted hyena is a beautiful animal. This is a female. Uh, she had pups just off in the ditch. They like to have her pups in the culverts underneath the roads. So uh, typically when you're going down the road, you look at the culverts, and if you see little bones scattered out in front, you probably know that's a <laughs> culvert being used to raise pups. And so she was coming back with a belly full, uh, been out on a hunt. They're great predators. They hunt all kinds of, of animals, whatever they can catch. And, uh, but it's one of the, the big predators. This has the strongest jaw muscle of any animal. They can crack bones, uh, large sized bones, and they swallow them in whole. They eat the bones, hair, meat, everything. They leave nothing to chance. They eat it all. And then their uh, excrement is white from the calcium of the bones that they eat. You usually look it wrong. Yep, that's hyena. No. <laughs> this is a young jackal. It's uh, what we equivalent to our coyote, about that size. This is a young one. And uh, they're great hunters as well. They catch a lot of the smaller animals. They'll catch birds. Uh, they'll catch all kinds of whatever they can catch. They'll catch snakes. Uh, they're pretty good. At, Predators of snakes. So 
again, unless you have a good number of other animals in numbers, these numbers are going to decline. So you really need to manage your resources well. This is the most dangerous predator of all. <laughs> Kills more people in Africa than any other animal, uh, the hippo. One of my favorite stories, uh, we were there one day and there was about a 450 yard pond and this, this big uh, bull hippo was way in the back. And when we pulled down to the edge of the ravine, he raised his head up and he bellowed. And then they started coming towards us. He got about 200 yards away and he bellows about four or five more times. Got 100 yards away and he starts chopping his teeth. <laughs> when he was about 40 yards away, my outsider says he's telling us it's time to leave. <laughs> and so we did. They're very dangerous animals, not raised on game farms. They're grazers. They come out at night and they graze on grasses. And they spend the entire night grazing. They go back to their pools. A group of hippos is called a pod. Okay, just so you know, hippos are a pod of hippos. They go back using there's one bull and a whole bunch of other females. And they have those great big teeth to challenge other bulls to keep them away from the ones that uh, the females in their particular pod. The rhino problem. I want to spend just a little bit of time with the rhino problem. Cougar National Park had 8,000 rhinos in 2013. It's now down to less than 750. Poaching coming from two sources. One is the countries to the north and east are extremely poor. Uh, the people who live there uh, make a typical salary of Mozambique, $480 a month or less. So they see a single rhino horn as a, if they capture one and sell it on the black market, they can get a almost a lifetime worth of, of income <clears throat> by capturing one rhino horn. Uh, South Africa, one of the official numbers that South African government tells you has about a 32% unemployment rate the unofficial is nearly 50%. About half of their population is still struggling a great deal just to survive, meet their daily needs, and the population's growing. This particular rhino, worth a million rand on the black market, $555,000 for one single horn. And what they do is they come in, they shoot the rhino, they use a haul uh, of uh, use an axe and they'll chop off right down to the base of the nose and take that off. And then the second horn, that's the, the white rhino, they'll chop that off and then leave the animals to rot. And they'll take those and sell them on the black market for that big number. If they farm them, they can protect them and they can grow lots of these. They would be able to cut this off, surgically cut it off. It's like fingernail. Your fingernails grow and grow and grow. You have to trim them, and trim them. The same is true with the rhino, rhino horn. They are nothing more than keratin. And if you cut them off, you trim them off right, in about three and a half, four years, they're back to full size again, and you can do it again. And so they can provide all this supposedly need in these other countries by farming these animals. It's beginning to happen. And hopefully this will help save the rhino, particularly the black rhino, very endangered. Uh, I've never seen one in Kruger National Park, and yet I know they're there. And uh, you can tell that they're there, but rhinos go down the road. They like to walk the roads at night. It's easy walking. And they use a, a big circular pile of poo. <laughs> and the white rhinos make a big one, it's bigger than this table and twice as wide, a big circle. They come every day and they creep right there in the same spot. The black rhino comes along, drags his back feet across it, uh -huh. and urinates on the white rhino. <laughs> and they don't get along for some reason. One of them is a grazer, a white rhino. The black rhino is a browser. It picks, it, it, the jaws are, the lips are different. They pick leaves and things, they eat grass and what have you. But they're more of a browser like our deer. So it's an interesting thing. 
Well, I promised you a few pictures. <laughs> uh, whenever I go, I try to take pictures and I have hundreds of different bird pictures, but I thought I'd throw in just a few. Uh, it's a bachelor eagle, uh, about the size of our eagle. Feeds on uh, uh, rabbit-sized things. We'll, keep, we'll catch fish, we'll eat turtles. Uh, but it's a uh, kind of a scavenger eagle, much like our bald eagle. It's what, pretty much what it can catch. A beautiful bird, they're pr fairly plentiful. You usually see quite a number of them on a trip and uh, they're flying along. This is a red bill horn, uh, horn bill. Uh, they're cavity nesters. Think what's happening to the trees in Kruger. They're no longer growing big enough to develop cavities in them that these, these birds can nest in. So we've got to control their elephant problem. They're going to save the red bill or the yellow bill, horn bill, the gray horn bill, or several others uh, becoming a real issue. Uh, these are beautiful birds. Uh, they're fairly good size, and uh, they, they're still fairly plentiful. You can see quite a number of them. So uh, this is one of my favorites. This is the violet breasted roller. Uh, they're beautiful when they fly. Uh, they're tree nesters. Uh, the problem with if you're tree nesters and your Mopani trees are getting lower and lower, all of a sudden they're vulnerable to predators, particularly snakes, which now can crawl up through these various blind uh, sticks of brush and get to the nest and eat the, eat the young. So, again, just another issue that. Uh, we're going to preserve birds. We got to look at the habitat that they need and pay attention to what's happening. And so, uh, I, 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 just as an observer, I've seen these numbers on various things begin to decline. And that's just a general observation. I have no scientific data to show that, but I suspect people there could tell you that for sure. This is my favorite shot of the trip on <laughs> uh, March. I got a picture of an African pygmy kingfisher, a little tiny bird, it's only about this big. And uh, they feed pre predominantly not on, on uh, fish. The kingfisher is a little bit of a misnomer in this particular bird, but they eat a lot of insects. And uh, uh, very unusual to see one. That's the only one I've ever seen. Uh, and uh, they're beautiful little birds. But the other kingfishers are having more problems. This is a brown hooded kingfisher. And in order to contain the number of hippos, uh, South Africa calls their ponds, they call them dams. They're backed up uh, little pools of water. Uh, they went and opened them all up and drained them, uh, thinking they could decrease the number of hippos. The hippos just went to the river systems. And then they grazed the river systems, which had all the water bucks and the Kudu and the other animals that were eating grass in those areas. And so in order to, they chased them away from it. Now the little brown-headed kingfisher is left with no place to fish. You know, looking for little lizards, looking for, for small fish. Um, so when you try to solve one problem, they create another problem. Brown hornbill, I love the eyelashes on these guys. <laughs> Big, big eyelashes. They're about turkey-sized birds. Uh, they're very endangered. Uh, they are raising them now on, on the game farms more just to have them around. They're not hunting them. They're trying to increase the populations. Uh, they're beautiful birds. And uh, they're not real shy. Uh, they'll walk up to vehicles. And uh, the natives there ate them to almost near extinction. Uh, same thing happened to the American turkey. Uh, almost to extinction, now we've got turkeys everywhere. We've managed them, we're bringing them back. We're hopeful that the ground hornbill will do the same. Secretary birds. <laughs> Secretary birds, uh, free ranging grassland bird. Uh, they feed on lizards, snakes, Small mammals of any kind, if they can grab, they stomp them to death. They literally do. If you look at their legs, they're very thin, scaly legs. 
So a snake tries to bite them, it just ends up hitting a bunch of scales and things on their legs. And they stomp them to death, and then they eat them and swallow them whole. <laughs> so uh, they call them secretary birds. They got, they got their name by the little quills on the back, looked like a pen quill. That's why somebody called them secretary birds. It has nothing to do with anything else. Just those little quills on the back of the neck. They're pretty birds. They're fairly tall. They're about this high, you know, a little above waist high, uh, even taller than that. And they're great runners. They can really motor. This is the African fish eagle, much like our American eagle. The only difference is uh, the white tail is lacking. Uh, these feed predominantly on fish, and as ponds or the dams are decreasing in numbers and the streams are running dry sometimes, the fish populations are decreasing in certain areas, and so then the fish eagles decline. Uh, so it's very important that we pay attention to our environment, what's happening. This is one that's doing well, the Swainson spurfowl. We, it's very close to what we'd say grouse site. Our, our native grouse. This is a grassland bird. The more grasslands they have, the better this group, this particular bird does. They can nest in the grass. They can uh, reproduce. They have little chicks. Usually they have eight or 10 of them and they run around. They quickly dart into the grass and disappear. This one can disappear instantly. In the grass, you can't figure out where it went. They just disappear and camouflage is great. But uh, you can tell them by that red eye, you know, which they are. Egyptian geese do fly from Egypt and they go to South Africa. They winter over in South Africa. Uh, a lot of the large river systems, you'll see Egyptian geese quite frequently. And uh, just an unusual looking goose. Uh, when they fly, they have the white wing patches. You can see the white wing patches very clearly. And that's uh, fun to watch them and see them move along. This is the glossy ibis. Uh, the glossy ibis is a prober. It probes the ground for crickets mostly and worms. So they pick that big long beak and they drill down to the ground and they'll throw their head up and throw whatever they have and up there and they'll grab it and swallow it. Um, whenever you find a, a, a lawn, Somebody's watering their lawn. Invariably, even in the cities and towns, the glossy ibis will hit that lawn if they're watering and begin probing. When you have a very dry climate, they have a tough time finding food. So climate change is affecting this bird as well. I just want to throw in a couple more pictures and then we'll ask questions. Uh, this is a baobab tree, 2,000 years old. I've seen about five of them that are this old. Most of them were cut down for lumber early. And then they tried to replant them. Well, when they replanted them, the elephants eat the bark mm -hmm. and they girdle them and they die. So if they don't have elephants around, okay, that's fine, they'll start growing. But when they got to be a certain size, now the commercial lumber people wanted them. So rarely do you get a bird, uh, one this size. This one has barn owls nesting in it. A big hole in the thing and the barn owls use it. It has a fruit that's about this big around. And if you crack it open, it's like cloves of garlic. Oh. And when you taste them, they taste, taste like vitamin C. <laughs> so we got You can suck on them. I've done it. And uh, it, it's... Uh, it's a unique flavor, <laughs> but elephants love it. Monkeys love it. You know, various animals feed on it. Well, a big tree like this produces a huge amount of, of fruit. So it's a, a good tree to have around. Well, that kind of, that's the fun in South Africa for me. I try to keep this to enough time, 40 minutes, 50 minutes, in order to answer a few questions. But this is one of my favorite times of the evening in South Africa. The bats come out, the monkeys begin to chatter more, everything begins to get quiet. And when the sun gets to this level, it takes two and a half minutes to go down to total darkness. Mm -hmm. 
very quick sunsets in South Africa. My concern is the sunset of many animals and bird species is happening right under our nose and we're not paying attention. And it can happen here too. Okay, questions, anything? Feel free to ask. Yes. When's your next trip and where's it gonna be? <laughs> I, I travel quite a bit, but, but uh, my next trip, I'll be doing a mission trip to Ghana in January. I've been doing mission work there for quite a long time. So I work with a village in North Central Ghana. We're building an orphanage and obstetrics facility right now. Uh, next time I go to South Africa will be August of 2024. Uh, there is one spot open in March of 2024. April's full already. But I'm working on March at this point. So I can tell you about that later. But since you asked the first question, <laughs> you get a 2023 South African bird calendar. Thank you. <laughs> Sell it for 10 bucks. <laughs> Other question. Anything came up you want to ask about? Yes. Um, in uh, Botswana, they cut the horns of the rhinos off. Yes, they do in Kruger as well. And that's the way they can, they dart them, they cut the horn off, and that's uh, no longer poachers are no longer interested in that particular animal. Uh, finding them is a trick. <laughs> Yeah, you gotta be pretty good, get close enough to dart a rhino. They're pretty dangerous. But it's, it's done regularly in Kruger National Park. That's what they're doing. Trying to, and the numbers are starting to increase a little in the park. That Jeff. John, if conservation isn't a big thing in, with the government, then what is your hope for good things to happen in the future? I mean, what it would my only hope at this point, from my perspective, is these big game farms that can continue to produce large numbers of animals. They manage their habitats well on these game farms. Remember that uh, the number of game farms, a huge, huge area. The downside of that, they're almost all owned by white people in a back country. So this is bound to politically change over time. And they're going to have to figure out how to manage the land because a lot of people want land. They got to they got to eat, and the population is exploding. So it's it's a continual issue. Uh, there is some hope from the government viewpoint. They're starting to support managing animals and and habitat areas. The park system is only most of the national parks are underfunded in that. It, and Kruger is the only one that attracts millions of people on an annual basis. The average person, though, in South Africa can no longer afford to go to Kruger National Park. They're not wealthy enough. Out of, out of country people come, they spend lots of money. Uh, the government uses that money, and so that's a good thing. Uh, not true of all their parks. Yes? What were, do, do they have any proposed solutions for the elephant? management problem or they're working on it right now i think they're going to call large call large numbers of elephants soon uh, and it's going to be a massive issue internationally what about south africa is killing all the elephants how did it how is it the how is feeling there do people care there that they do that people or? in south africa we've got to control it they have no problem with shooting them none whatsoever the average person there says, so got too many of them? You know, let's, let's, let's sell them to the big game hunters. Let's charge them $150,000 of elephant. And then we'll take all the meat and we'll distribute it to people who need meat. That's the uh, South African approach to it. They don't think anything about that. Internationally, why we hear the fewer when they start calling all of them. Yeah. 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 Are they doing anything to manage their own population, human population? <laughs> it's a question. Are they doing anything to manage your human population? The answer is no. Like many countries, uh, too many kids, not enough jobs. Uh, it's a second world country. Uh, the infrastructure is pretty good. They do have electricity that works most of the time. <laughs> I say most of the time because it goes off and on during the day. 
Their roads are fairly decent. They have paved roads, they have interstate systems, they have whole, whole booths. Uh, you can drink the water in South Africa, where why go in Ghana, you can't drink the water at all. The roads are horrible. Different, different countries. What's the most common vehicle that they use there? Brand and type, uh, four wheel drive, two wheel drive. Uh, there are all kinds. I mean, you see almost everything. You go through a little town, then you got the Toyota dealer here. You got the Land Rover dealer over there. You got, you know, you got Ford pickups over here. You got all kinds of things. A lot of people can't afford a vehicle. Yeah. They're very expensive. John, is are the big game farms becoming economically viable enough to have some political power or influence? They're big enough. The political power is an amount of money they bring into the country. Right. And so that's, they haven't attacked them per se from a government viewpoint. They've kind of supported them. They've allowed them to expand. Uh, my outfit are just bought a mountain. Going, <laughs> but, but you're saying they're not yet viable enough as a political economic force. They're pretty strong. There's a professional hunter association that most of the game managers and game farmers belong to. It's a pretty big organization. They do have some political clout, um, but it's being challenged because they're white. South Africa, you're, you're white or you're colored or you're black. Colors are uh, interracial or Indian or Chinese or whatever you're colored, or you're black or you're white. And what, how, how does that um, play out in, in political influence or power? White, colored, black. Are for there... the most part, now the blacks are in charge and of the whole country. That's in the last 15, 20 years, that's switched over. And it's causing major problems of all kinds. And one guy said to me, he said, you know, uh, our part say, you think about when the slaves were freed in this country 300 years ago. He said, we're only 30 years out. If you've had 300 years to work at this issue. You haven't solved it. <laughs> so that's the same type of thing, dynamics that's going on in South Africa. Um, Bob? Uh, is there a uh, problem with uh, diseases on these game farms? We have a relatively small amount of genetic diversity and a very large population drive. From uh, that. There are there are quite a few of, uh, tropical mm -hmm. diseases that affect their game animals. Uh, they have, I never said brucellosis uh, is a problem. Uh, their big game vets are continually managing and testing the animals. All the time. In fact, almost every farm has a big game vet visiting regularly to test, do blood tests on animal samples and to see if they've got a problem. But they do have they do have issues. Yeah. Yeah, one thing um, I learned on our trip in March is that I wasn't sure when the poachers would do their work. And the poachers, at least in Kruger National Park, seem to like to do it during darkness because then they'll be less likely to be found out. And as a result, the Kruger National Park uh, wants everyone in their place, in their lodging by 6 p.m. And I had no idea that, that was the case. What the poachers do is they locate during the day, they'll locate an animal that they want to poach. They'll wait till night, they're very close proximity, and they'll shine them and they'll kill them They'll grab the horn and they'll try to get out as fast as they can. And that's right. The, the compounds that people stay in in national parks, they open the gates in the morning at six o'clock in the morning. They're electrified fences because all around you are wild animals. Uh, and then at night at six o'clock, they close the gate, re-electrify the fence. If you're not inside, you're considered a poacher. It doesn't matter. Everybody who's in those parks, they know you better be inside the compound by six o'clock at night. And what you see is people speeding like mad. Oh, <laughs> no. you know, 10 to six, just going like crazy. Yeah. To get inside. We saw that happen this year. And <laughs> as a result, um, nocturnal animals, especially hyenas, are a little more difficult to find there than you would expect because they're nocturnal and they're active at night. And, if there's a 6 p.m. you can't be out there at night on your game drive. 
<laughs> still need to be able to lay in bed at night here to lion for her outside. Yeah. And, and the zebras bray and, you know, the hyenas uh, give their whoop. And uh, so it's still a neat feeling. Uh, you do still have some of that wildness to it that's uh, kind of unique that a lot of places don't have. Well, we're getting close to eight o'clock, and I told everybody to keep this down. I'll be sticking around. You can ask any kind of questions uh, you want. Uh, I am leading a Grand Canyon rafting trip for Audubon on uh, 20 July of 2024. If you want to go Grand Canyon rafting with me, just let me know. I'll go careful for the details. And then uh, I do the South Africa trips, and uh, my outfitter is donating to the Audubon group for every Audubon member who goes on one of these trips. So if you're interested in South Africa, then I'd be happy to talk to you about that as well. I don't want to dwell on that. You can ask me later privately. So anything else? Thanks, John. You can have some unfinished business. You put your names in the bucket. And uh, I guess the first item, do you want to tell us about this? Yeah, I'll tell you about all these real quick. Okay. Uh, Kent Hall is a longtime member. Kent is uh, in a nursing home right now. He sold his house, and his daughter Sherry uh, said Kent wanted Audubon to have a whole bunch of these things. And so he had gave I, my garage is full of all kinds of little things, mm -hmm. lots of pictures and things. We're going to have an auction sometime, and some has really good photographs and lithographs and things. But I thought this was really unique when Bob Preston was looking at it saying, what is all this stuff? How is this made? And what is it? The combination of several things. It's a neat what little, kind of plants are little bird, birdhouse. I don't know if I would hang it outside. I might put this thing someplace thick on the porch. Uh, but it's very unique. Go ahead and draw for it. Okay. It goes to Madge Bishop. <laughs> Hey, while we're doing this, I have just a couple of announcements. At the May meeting, um, we need you, our members, to help us with a couple things. And that is you approve of the makeup of the board for the following year. And so we'll that's going to be in the May newsletter. And then uh, we'll bring that to you and uh, have you vote on that. The other thing we did is we revised our bylaws. The last time they were done was 2006, it's 2023. And we, our bylaws say that we need you, the membership, to approve of those bylaws. Um, let's see, those are in the newsletter, in the main newsletter, I will have a link and the changes to those bylaws are going to be on our website. So you'll be able to see exactly They're what on there right now. Under Jenny did that today. Jenny Christopher, <laughs> our webmaster. <laughs> okay, John, what do you have? Go ahead, draw it. I'll draw it. Okay, <laughs> this one goes to Lynn Wyman. Okay. Kent was well known as Dr. Bluebird. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. You know, helped us build that 1300 box bluebird trail, raised thousands of bluebirds. So, one of the photographs of a bluebird. One more. One more. This goes to Mike Oriella. Yeah. Mike. Hey. This is a uh, very nice uh, welcome crime with a nice bluebird on it. Uh, quite nice. Yeah. I think it's signed. Also in May, we have a uh, Emily Filibetti, I think her last name is. She is studying golden wing warblers in Wisconsin and on the East Coast. And uh, she's going to be our presenter. So um, it should be a fascinating talk once again. So look forward to that. And we'll see you in May. Anything else we need to announce? I think that was it. Thanks for being here. over on the side. Yeah. Sure yeah. Snacks to 